everyone, and welcome to another episode of Men in Stripes, our Stripe Hype podcast. And joining me for the first time as a trio, I'm joined with Matthew Wilson and Tim Daniel. How are you guys doing tonight? Hey, man. What's up? Yeah, it should be an exciting week. It's always nice. The Bengals uh, kind of get the game out of the way on Thursday. You can enjoy your Sunday uh, worry-free, as I yeah. like to call it, as, as long as the Bengals win, of course, on that Thursday. Uh, real quick, guys, uh, still want to talk about the Broncos game a little bit. I know we've got some good content up on Stripe Hype, uh, but let's let's run it down a bit. You know, uh, Denver came in uh, 2-0. and They left 3-0. and The Bengals were in kind of unfamiliar waters here. Uh, last couple years, we've gotten off to great starts. Last year, of course, 8-0. The year prior to that, at this time, we were 3-0, and heading into a week four bye before we got creamed in New England, went to 3-1. and Yeah. So we go back to that Broncos game, 29-17 to final, and I uh, wanted to ask your guys' opinions, uh, weaknesses-wise, Where, uh, what are a few weaknesses you guys saw in that game and the loss to Denver? Yeah, we'll start with you, Tim. Cool, yeah, that's fine. Um, I think the big weakness for me was um, lack of pass rush. I know towards the end of the game, Carlos Dunlap got a sack in there, and that was big. That's his 50th career. Congrats to him. But uh, the sec- on the defensive side of the ball, I thought the pass rush really dictated – Trevor Simeon be able to have a successful day because if the pass rush is on point as we've seen in the in Ghost of Bengals past that secondary has great games um special teams is still a little bit of a concern for me I understand that they'll there's uh the one return that, that Norwood has in the second half that there were just nice blocks Denver did a great job executing the blocks on that and uh, he ended up getting a nice return there uh but on our end obviously there's the Adam Jones which wasn't a fumble God, I can't believe I have to say that two weeks in a row that it's not a fumble. But I thought that he got we got hosed there, and um, I do agree with Adam Jones saying we will not probably not get that call all season. And then honestly, just execution on the offensive side was really frustrating. Um, you know, you guys will never probably never hear me say a bad thing about AJ Green, obviously, but that drop he had on third down when they were rolling is unacceptable. You know, for being one of the best in the game, I mean, I've, I've been on here and I say I, I put him in the top three in the game. It's 100% unacceptable to have that drop from who he is, from what, you know, he is, and, you know, I fully respect him for owning it and saying that it's on me. This is my, uh, the offense runs through me. I 100% respect that. And especially in a game where they're running the ball well, I mean, gaining about, gaining over 140 on the, on the, uh, on rushing the ball. They really need AJ Green to make those plays because as much as I love the prospect of, of Tyler Boyd, He's not out there to make big. He's not making huge plays in ter- turban games yet, and you know, for right now, with everything going on with this transition, with not having Eifert, with the offensive line struggling, uh, when you have a chance to get a throw off like Dalton did, AJ's got to come down with that ball. Man. Yeah, I mean that's that's exactly right. I mean, the big thing there for the weakness has to be officiating, but that's on the NFL. Uh, weakness for the Bengals is the front. I mean. Four sacks allowed. You can't be not giving Andy Dalton the time that he needs to get rid of the ball. And, and so this front line of the offense needs to get on it. If they can't, they need to find somebody who can, whether it be trade, which the Bengals aren't known to do, uh, or find somebody who is you know, still kind of, you know, we've, we've seen people come in who are veterans who may have not been signed. Bring them in for at least a tryout. We got to find some way to protect Andy Dalton. Uh, I, I know Shelby. We talked last week a little bit about Ryan Hewitt. You know, where is he to be able to step up and kind of add that blocking aspect? Um, you know, he's supposed to be the fullback for this team. Even though Tyler Eifert's not there, they have Croft and they have uh, Azoma to be the tight ends. So throw Ryan Hewitt into that fullback spot. Give him an extra br- uh, blocker. And if you're only going to run one back, it's it's already going to be a passing why not throw ryan hewitt as the running back at least for that to bring an extra blocker into the play uh in, in that situation if this offensive line isn't going to block properly uh defensive wise you've got to as the safety be over top i mean the, the corners were getting beat and you have two safeties who are supposed to be going over the top and covering and we didn't see that, especially on the uh, the, the touchdown that uh, Emmanuel Sanders had that was like, what, 42 yards, yeah. uh, I believe? Or on somewhere third and long. On, yeah, on third and long. 
you cannot get beat like that. And where was the safety? He was in the middle of the field reacting to the ball in the air instead of reacting to the player uh, who was basically already beaten before the ball was thrown. And, and so these safeties have to learn to react before and be proactive with their reads compared to being reactive. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And with the safety spot, it's kind of we were spoiled for a while there with Reggie Nelson, who was just a borderline ball hawk. I think you both would agree. And, you know, those deep passes, he kind of was similar to Ed Reed in that stance. He wasn't a big hitter like Reed was. But, you know, a deep ball, you can bet uh, Nelson was back there uh, making a play on it, as he did so many times. What it seemed like with Big Ben a lot, always had his number in, in games. Uh, I'm right there with you, Tim. I think the biggest uh, weakness in this game was – Uh, the lack of a pass rush. Uh, I don't care who's playing quarterback, if it's Simeon, if it's, you know, Brady Quinn with the Browns, uh, anyone back there. When they have the pocket that Simeon had on Sunday and have the weapons with Emmanuel Sanders and Demarius Thomas, you're going to get picked apart. You know, some of those passes, uh, you know, the last touchdown, uh, Chris Lewis-Harris I thought was in pretty good coverage. Uh, He might have been a step behind Demarius Thomas. He just didn't look back for the ball in time. Had his hand right in the middle of DT's chest, and he was still able to haul it in. I mean, a, an unlucky break there. But, yeah, Simeon gets a lot of hype for, you know, having a great game, which he did. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the Bengals dropped a lot of interceptions. Sean Williams dropped a big one that hit oh, yeah. him right in the chest. A tip pass fluttered in the middle of the field, landed in between two Bengals. Uh, Dunlap made a great play on that. Uh, but, yeah, Simeon, too many times he had uh, just all day to throw. And I thought most of the time, too, once Sanders beat uh, Pac-Man deep, uh, Pac-Man was playing back a lot. I know Benny Fowler caught two passes underneath and on third downs, and the Broncos love to run those screen passes. So I think the Broncos' game plan in the second half, uh, you know, they outscored us. We only put up three points. Uh, but, yeah, I, I agree with what both of you guys said as far as the weaknesses go. You know, on offense, uh, that Denver defense is the best in the NFL, uh, arguably with Minnesota, but I'd say Denver has the upper hand there. And when Dalton's able to find an open A.J. Green – Third down, and that that's right after Denver had just drove the length of the field to take a set, uh, take a uh, twenty-two to seventeen lead. Bengals go three and out. And you got to put that defense right back on the field. And special teams, yeah, it's concerning. Him could wasn't a fumble, knee was down, but you know, t- two weeks in a row, like you said. So what else would we expect? Yeah, the Cody Latimer's big kick return set up a touchdown, and uh, but I think those are that was like what you said. Denver had good blocking on the play, but you know, in that Denver game. Not everything was bad. You know, the, the Bengals were up one point in the fourth quarter against a defending Super Bowl champion. I just wanted to see uh, what uh, positives you guys took away from this game. We'll start with you, Matt. Oh, well, probably one of, the, one of the bigger positives we saw was Jeremy Hill. Uh, huge positive. 97 yards, I believe it was 17 carries. Uh, he was a, a huge factor with two touchdowns. He seemed to figure out that you are allowed to bounce off of the line if you can find openings uh you don't have to continue trying to run through it uh and and that was huge because that was one of the that was one of the bigger touchdowns to try to at least gain some momentum back especially after a fumble on a punt or a not fumble on a punt uh and then they went down and and took the lead 10 10 to 7 and so for jeremy hill to come back and make a great run like that and uh make some great plays It it was a huge week for him, and uh, I know it's something that he's looking to continue to build on for sure. Um, I'll stay on the offensive side, man. Uh, I really want to touch on, for something we were all greatly worried about, I was really impressed with how well Cedric Aguayi played. Um, I understand that Von Miller did get a couple plays in the the backfield. I think he got a sack on the last drive. But, I mean, he held his own, and he played very well in that game. I don't know what Pro Football Focus rated him or not. But I thought for, you know, everything going into that game, for going against the best defensive player in the game, I was very impressed with him. Um, You know, Matthew, you mentioned the lack of Ryan Hewitt the first couple weeks. We saw him a little bit in this game, and that did help Jeremy Hill's success running the ball. So I was happy there. But guys, like, so far through three games, I feel like every time Marcus Hunt's on the field, he's making a play. Um, Shell, before you came and joined us on this team, Matthew and I had a big talk about after Wallace Gilberry leaves, you know, what happens with uh, Marcus Hunt and Will Clark. And those guys have stepped in that role and done really well so far. So losing to Denver is nothing to be ashamed about. 
by any stretch, especially, you know, I don't think that uh, I agree with the Bengals. They shouldn't be in panic mode yet. But in those losses where you're seeing those effects of Jones and Sanu, and not really Sanu, honestly, minus one touchdown, him and Boyd are pretty similar. Um, that loss of Gilberry and Lemur, you know, guys like Dansby and Hunt and Clark are really stepping in and doing well in those roles. Yeah, I yeah, agree with you, Tim. I was going to say Obwehi, and yeah, with Von Miller, uh, you know, two years ago when the Broncos came to the to Cincinnati for a Monday night game, Miller uh, didn't have a single tackle, didn't have a sack. He did strip Jeremy Hill once. That was really his only stat line of that game. And yeah, Von Miller, he got his uh, he got his reps in late in the game, but I feel like that's kind of like what Von Miller does. You know, a lot of the times he's very quiet at, at, during the course of the game, and then when Denver builds a lead, and forces other quarterbacks to throw. Miller's not worried about the run. He can just go straight after the quarterback. And that last Seal drive, it. that last drive with the Bengals down 12, they're obviously going to throw every play. So I, it didn't surprise me that a boy he gave up a sack. Uh, from the positives, yeah, I mean, uh, the biggest to take away, I think, besides a boy, he would have to be Jeremy Hill. And I think the Bengals uh, got him running a bit with. Uh, Kind of what the Steelers do with Le'Veon Bell that we saw a few times when uh, Bell played against Cincinnati is kind of pulling a guard in a tackle. Uh, he sprung that 50-yarder on the Bengals' first drive with uh, Kevin Zeitler, and I want to say uh, Obwehi pulling to the yeah. left. Uh, kicked out blockers beautifully. I think Ryan Hewitt was the fullback on that play. I mean, that was textbook Lombardi drawing on a chalkboard. Uh, Hill busted through, nearly broke it for a 53-yard touchdown, but then he made up for it for the next play. So, yeah, going forward, um, loved what I saw out of Jeremy Hill. Uh, you know, as far as the offense in general, you know, Dalton was playing the best defense, the best secondary. Uh, I mean, a secondary that made Cam Newton look foolish twice, beat up on Andrew Luck last week, so I'm not really worried, and I'm not really ready to hit that panic button yet either, so... Yeah, I'm with you, man. Uh, one thing we should mention, too, before we move to the next segment. Sorry, Shelby. Um, Jake Fisher, um, number 74 is reporting eligible. I think I mentioned that there after the Steelers game. That was going to be a huge thing in this game plan. And he also played well when he was in this game. So um, we don't know what the future exactly holds post-Whitworth, but we know if they're going to build their tackle play around Fisher and boy, we have a lot to be excited about. Hmm. Very much so. Good protecting the edges. And, you know, Whitworth... Uh, Hasn't been himself through the first couple games. Uh, Shane Ray beat him for a sack or two in that loss to Denver. Uh, I think he got a holding penalty also. Uh, yep. But, you know, he's a, he's a veteran, so, you know, hopefully he'll be bouncing back. So that'll wrap it up for the Denver game and ready to put that one behind us. It's a short week. And the Bengals, in just two days after the Broncos lost, some news going around. First, go to the Pro Bowl tight end Tyler Eifert. Uh Looking like he could be coming back to this offense either this week or next week when the Bengals visit Dallas. So far, all the media reports we've heard is Eifert, pretty much the common uh, story when a player gets hurt. Oh, I want to get back on the field. I want to be back in the lineup. And Marvin Lewis or the head coach saying, okay, slow down a bit. And, you know, uh, Tim, I'll start with you. And Do you think Eifert should play? And, and how much does this offense need him right now? I think the offense needs him a lot. I think that having Tyler Eifert out there is not only going to help A.J. Green, obviously, but it's going to really help those guys like Tyler Boyd and Brandon LaFell who are still getting familiar with how they're, with what their role is in this offense. Um, I think he should play. Now, it's all up to how his ankle's feeling, obviously, because they have... Today was their last day of practice. Tomorrow's the walkthrough. It's going to be a, slow, it's going to be a fast walkthrough for them, as uh, Catherine Terrell from ESPN mentioned. Um... If he doesn't go, if he goes out there and plays, and he doesn't get it, like he doesn't have a huge game, that's fine. If he goes out there and has like one catch, that's fine. But as long as he gets in a groove, in a, in a rhythm, and in a groove, uh, very similar to how the Patriots used Gronk last week in their Thursday night game, where uh, Gronk only played about 14 snaps. He didn't have any catches. He had two or three targets, I think. Uh, obviously, they didn't need them because Jacoby Brissett just made Houston look terrible. Makes me feel better about Christmas Eve, guys. I'll tell you what. Um, but. If Tyler Eifert is not back this week, I don't think it's a huge deal. Um, no disrespect to the Miami Dolphins, I don't think this is 1972. So, um, I would love to see Tyler Eifert back. I think it would help a lot because minus since the Jets game, C.J. Uzoma has had one play we're talking about, and that was more a beautiful throw by Andy Dalton than it was a great catch by C.J. Uzoma. Though I give him props for holding on to it when it's come to the ground. Um, if it's not this week, I think they're okay. 
But if the worst is they have him for AT&T Stadium going against the Dallas Cowboys, who are giving up a lot of yards right now, even without Jay Cutler the other night, I, I feel pretty good about that. Yeah, I mean, for Tyler Eifert, it, it, it's looking more and more as, as more news comes out that he's probably going to be a, a week five returner. Um, ESPN putting out that, that he is not expected to play, uh, even though he would love to come back. And we all know Tyler Eifert wants to come back and wants to be in the game. If he wouldn't, then he wouldn't be, you know, a, a, an NFL player. You always want to get back on the field as a pro, but... Um, I, I think it's probably best for him to, to take it one more week, get into the flow of things again, uh, get some of the, the rust off and practice instead of having to go towards the game. Um, and, and it's going to be a long week for him to, to get back into it, get adjusted to some of the newer guys, of course, with uh, Brandon LaFell and, and Tyler Boyd uh, coming in to play more. And so uh, if, he can, if he can get that – practice time, if he can get really that uh, availability to work with Dalton and the offense as it sits now, it's going to benefit him because he's going to be able to make better reads that way like he did last season. But this team, of course, is a whole different look from last season with the exception of, of course, Andy Dalton and A.J. Green. So uh, give him an extra week. Let him go on the long week. Uh, let this offense do what uh, it need, it's actually done okay at. It hasn't been spectacular, but it's it's been enough if the defense holds plenty of times to win. So uh, they, they just need to, to have the offense step up, have guys like A.J. Green and Tyler Boyd step up, and, of course, Giovanni Bernard and Jeremy Hill do their thing. And the defense just needs to make stops. And so uh, that probably is a nice little segue for Shelby into the next guy. Well, yeah. Shelby, before you do, I did not mean to interrupt you. I literally just had some breaking news come across my phone. It's looking like the Houston Texans star defensive end J.J. Watt could potentially miss the remainder of this season after re-injuring wow. his back. Wow. Yeah, just hit mine too. Wow. Okay. That would suck, uh, man. Yeah. I, I'm looking Now I'm looking forward, forward to that game. I know. Chris, to see <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But with Eifert, I, Tim, I'm, I'm right there with you. The, the way the Patriots use Gronk, I mean, just the presence that he's there, uh, making a defense plan for him. As far he is a necessity in this offense. You know, the Bengals have been atrocious in the red zone. We saw it in Pittsburgh where they had to settle for three field goals. The Jets, they had to settle for one. Uh, I believe Mike Nugent's field goal against Denver to take the lead, that was also a red zone field goal, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, just his presence, uh, you know, the Bengals lost, or they or sorry, they won every game but one when he caught a touchdown last year, and I believe that loss was to Arizona in Phoenix that day. He caught two touchdowns uh, in that one. So, yeah, but, you know, you know he wants to come back Thursday night under the bright lights of prime time uh, at home instead of going uh, to Dallas. So I think if there is a way to work him in there, play him 15 to 20 snaps, I, I think Marvin should do it. And then now another returner, uh, no doubt that this guy will be on the field uh, Thursday night, and that is linebacker Vontez Burfecht. Uh, after serving his three-game suspension, that kind of uh, went on because of the uh, his actions in that wild card loss to Pittsburgh. And, you know, I'll start with you, Matt. And How big is Burfecht, uh, a guy who just kind of flies all over the field? It, I think the last three games of the season, playoffs included, he had a a leaping interception last year. Uh, how, how big is it the Bengals get him back on defense? Well, it's not only big for the play, but the emotion that he brings to the game. I mean, you can see how much he gets these guys fired up and, and wanting to play the game, wanting to get better, and, and wanting to make the plays. And, and that's something that I don't think you can replace. I think it's something that you, we saw missing from this team, of course, uh, a, a couple years ago when Geno Atkins got injured because Geno was the emotional leader. And so to get the emotional leader, especially in for the linebackers back, is probably going to bring up the play of everybody there because, of course, we've seen flat play from, from Ray Maluga, although he made, I think, one or two good plays in the Jets game. But you also have Vin, uh, Vincent Ray, who, again, has kind of played good at times, but it, we've seen a lot of flat times for him. The only person that we really haven't seen 
go flat so far, although he's made some mistakes too, is Carlos Dansby. But Carlos Dansby's never been in there with Vontez Burfick. So it's going to be interesting to see how his play even may elevate with the emotion of uh, Vontez Burfick in there. So, of course, Vontez Burfick is going to make a huge difference on this team when it comes to physicality and when it comes to uh, his ability to read plays. But it, it more comes from an emo- emotional standpoint for these guys because not only does he pick himself up emotionally, he really picks up that defense. I think what's going to be nice about this is we're now in a situation where the Bengals are really good linebacker-wise with ball handling skills. Um, obviously, we knew what Carlos Dansby was in pass coverage in his tenure in Arizona and Cleveland. And we even saw a little bit of that Sunday where really minus the red zone play action touch, uh, boot touchdown pass Denver had, Dansby really took out the line, took the tight ends out of that game. Uh, we all know what Vontes can do when he has a chance to go aggress- grab a ball out of the air as well. So, And also, and I think Vinny Ray is a very underrated uh, pass coverage linebacker as well. And uh, Matthew, you know, like you said, like you kind of hit the nail on the head. Vinny Ray's played really well this year. Uh, he's filled in well for Vontez. I know there was um, there's a few plays here and there. Uh, I think this is big for guys not only like him, but guys like Nick Vigil, who are really trying to get their reps on there and get on the field and really make a name for themselves. A rookie third bout round linebacker who has a lot of talent. He has a chance really to play Vontez perfect and learn just what it takes to be so good because I I think the sky is the limit for Vigil especially having guys like Jim Hazlitt as the linebacker coach and having guys like Paul Gunther as your D coordinator where they don't really blitz much, so they are going to learn about zones and pass coverages. Um, so I think that this is huge for the team all around. Um, I know Marvin's trying to hint around saying he's only going to play a little bit because he's Marvin Lewis and he doesn't like to give anything away. But I am excited, man. I think that this is going to be huge, like you said, for emotion, for physicality, for football IQ, to help this secondary out, to get this front seven back in groove. Uh, you have Vontez Burfitt coming, you play this one game, then you have 10 days off to get ready for Dallas, and Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott. It's a huge thing for this team moving forward. Yeah, yeah, big to get Burfitt back. And, and also, you know, Dansby's 34 years old, and if there's ever a spot where uh, Burfitt can get some reps and give anybody rest really and yeah Vinny Ray has played great so far this season uh one of the top leading tacklers as he always is and always so durable too is Vinny Ray uh don't think he's mis- missed much time uh in his tenure with the Bengals after going undrafted from Duke and now guys let's go into uh Thursday night's game against the Dolphins and uh we'll start with uh, a question that's kind of been uh, bugging me after I heard it after the Denver game as I was walking around upset in the city of Cincinnati. Uh, is this is this Miami game, is it a must-win game for the Bengals, sitting at 1-2 and two and having uh, Dallas and New England coming up the next two weeks? We'll start oh. with you, Tim. Must win, no. Gut check, totally. Um, I think that if you can finish the first quarter of the season 2-2, two and two, um, I think Dallas is a winnable game. I'm really not 100% sure if I think New England's a winnable game. But... After that, man, like if you look at the schedule, Washington, the Giants, there's a lot of winnable games on the schedule after that. Um, Even Baltimore twice. Yeah. Yes, exactly, because I know the Ravens are 3-0, and but they are not an impressive 3-0 and by any means. Um, so I think that that's big. Um, I, I, I think that this is going to be big for them. I think that having the short turnaround to get the taste out of their mouth from Denver, to go in there and play a, a Miami team that they are better than um, – I really believe they're better than, and they're going to really be able to chance to show that it's going to be big for them. And um, as much as I think that, you know, I love that young Dolphins wide receiving core uh, with guys like Parker and guys like Landry, um, there is no Jordan Cameron in this game. We obviously know there's no Arian Foster in this game. So this is a big chance for the Bengals to lick their chops and get back on it and get 2-2 two and two and get ready to go to Texas Stadium. I mean... The big thing that's going to come into play, obviously, are uh, Ndamukong Sue is leading the team with two and a half sacks uh, so far in the, in the three games. Uh, really, after that, I mean, Kiko Alonso is, is again, kind of the Dolphins' version of Vontez Burfick when it comes to the emotional leaders of the linebackers. But he even really has, hasn't done much in terms of pressure on the quarterback and, and stopping people in the backfield. His role has more been kind of up the gut, which which is very interesting for him. And, and so we aren't seeing the best Dolphins team that I think a lot of people were kind of hoping would get rejuvenated this season, especially Miami fans. And uh, so this is a perfect time for the Bengals to take advantage. Of course, they're coming off of an overtime win where they barely won last week. 
Uh, and it was because of a missed field. Um, so, especially with Kiko Alonso, I mean, he is kind of the Bengals' version, of, or he's basically the Dolphins' version of Vontez Perfect. He's an emotional leader of the linebackers, and he really hasn't been in the backfield doing much and pressuring the quarterback. So, even he's kind of down. This, this team really is, you know, struggling. I mean, when, when you look at what this team does uh, from – you know, at least this season, what people's expectations are, they're really underperforming. And so what better for the Bengals than to kick them while they're down? I mean, they just lost, or they just barely beat the Cleveland Browns in overtime on a game that they were very lucky to, to, to even win be, uh, based on a, a field goal that was missed by Cleveland. And we talk about Cleveland finding new ways to lose. It's a, You know, so for this Dolphins team. This Dolphins team is really struggling, and it's and it's great for the Bengals because they can really have a, a time to, you know, really get back on track and get to two and two. Uh, but it's going to take a strong, still a strong performance in prime time, a place where Bengals, I guess, in recent history, struggled until last year, and then it, we even saw some struggles there too. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to to really seeing if the Bengals can. Uh, kick the Dolphins while they're down, get to two and two, and, and head into a, a couple decent games uh, with a 500 record and, and taking advantage of it. Yeah, and I definitely don't see this as a must-win game, uh, but definitely a game with importance. Uh, I mean, everything is when you're one and two, but just back to back, just brutal places to play in Dallas and New England, and you know. The Cowboys playing very good right now, and they got a young core. And you know, I, I think the Bengals I desperately. It's as close to a must win as possible, but it's not because it's so early in the season. And you mentioned Matt the the prime time narrative, and it's kind of gotten old and played out. And you know, the Bengals can't win on prime time uh, last year. Uh, as far as prime time games go, I thought they played pretty well. Yeah. Except for one game, which we can all agree was Houston. Mm-hmm. Uh, lost 10 to six at home on Monday night, but the week uh, before that, uh, 31 to 10 win over the Browns. And then after Houston, uh, you take a very good Arizona Cardinals team. And if it wasn't for what I thought was a questionable play call by Hugh Jackson to throw uh, a deep past AJ Green and stop the clock and settle for a game tying field goal, uh, we might be talking a little differently and maybe a, a victory in that game. And then finally, their last prime time game before the playoff loss was. Uh, with a backup quarterback, A.J. McCarron, uh, on the road against Denver, and you take that team to overtime, lose on a botched snap, uh, but, you know, that team goes on to win the Super Bowl. But anyway, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, that, does this? do you think these players are affected at all by the primetime narrative that this mainstream media has kind of pushed on the Bengals? And, you know, when you watch ESPN or SportsCenter, whatever, NFL Network, and it's always, uh, well, can the Bengals win on primetime when – you know, a good opponent comes to their house, or they have to go somewhere. And and how much of a how much of a factor do you think that is? I think the sack of crap. I yeah. think we're at the point where like it's been a, it's play, like you said it's played out. Um, if we're talking young Andy Dalton in years one and two, okay, I'll give you that fight. That's fine. Um, but you know, since then, like, let's go to year three. Monday night against the Steelers in Cincinnati, they win. I know they lose. The Sunday night game and Kevin Huber gets his jaw jacked, but I don't really count that game because that was crap. Um, you know, the next year, Monday Night Football, the Denver Broncos, Jeremy Hill's coming out party, they win. Um, and then, like you mentioned, the four primetime games where there were certainly circumstances. Um, you mentioned the play call where Andy throws the AJ to try to win the game there. Uh, I mentioned that Demo- them calling Domo Tapeco for simulating the snap um i said you know and you mentioned aj mccarron that circumstance there um i i I thought that you know overall they were good they were good on prime time um i don't think it matters as far as like they get down like i don't think they get scared of the lights per se i do think it motivates them now i think that they are tired of hearing about it and they are ready for this for the moment like this where they can go in there and say like I know we're one and two, and you guys don't believe in us right now. And this is our the situation where we hit our kryptonite, as you say. But now's our time to shine, and we're going to show you we can do it. 
Yeah, and I mean, what, one thing we can't forget is the fact that this is a this has a lot of new players to this team that weren't a part of the the teams that we really said about the struggles of prime time. I mean, you look at Tyler Boyd and Brandon LaFell, two guys who haven't really had that narrative above them. You look at Cedric Ogbui and, and, and Jake Fisher, two guys who just came in last season when the Bengals actually did do fairly well in prime time. You go on the other side of the ball, and you have Carlos Dansby, a, a guy who just came into this this team wanting to win a Super Bowl with this team. Uh, and so you really look at some of the key players there, and the key players that are there don't know the narrative, and the players that do are motivated. And that's something that I think is is key for this team in, in tr- coming in with a fresh mind compared to having that narrative hanging above their head that, that we'll hear, especially Thursday night in you know the pregame. Is, is, can they do it again? Can they can they come back and uh, from a one and two start to to win in prime time? And and that's something they've struggled with in the past. We're going to hear that narrative, and that's that's unavoidable. But these guys have a fresh mind going into to this game and, and, and even into the season uh, from what we've seen in the past. Yeah, and, and my problem with. Uh, them saying about the primetime struggles. I mean, it's not like we're getting blown out. Right. I mean, when when's the last primetime game where I think maybe New England in 2014? Yeah. We lost 40 we lost 43 to 17. But other than that, I mean, these are winnable games. We lost to Houston by 4, we lost to Denver by 3 in overtime, we lost to Arizona uh by single digits. I I think the score was 34 to 31 in that yep. game. So, uh in you know, it's not like uh Andy Dalton throwing three interceptions in his rookie playoff game against Houston or, uh, you know, getting blown out. And, you know, even 2012, we won a road primetime game against the Eagles uh, that year. So four yeah. straight years, we've won at least one primetime game. And But, you know, as as much as we complain about it, the only way for it to let up is for the Bengals to win. I mean, we can sit and talk about how well it's came close. But, you know, even if we dominate the game and lose – by a point that you know that's still going to be the narrative and it's still going to fall on the heels of our quarterback as well and the uh to answer your question the last bad primetime loss was the cleveland browns on november 6th where they lost 3 to 24 at home i was there they night football yeah i i i go to school at ou and athens is about probably 70 percent browns fans so it was it was a bad week of school, and I and I talked a lot of trash before that game. So yeah, but then Jeremy Hill made up for that later in the year. Oh, yeah. oh, that that was great, Manziel's, Manziel's debut. Yeah. So anyway, guys, now we turn the focus to Miami, and I'll, I'll give you each the opportunity uh, if you want to uh, one person from the Miami offense and one person on defense. I know you guys have already touched up a little bit that that Cincinnati really has to key on. Jarvis Landry. I think that as much as I love Devontae Parker, and I think that he's going to be an outstanding NFL wide receiver, he feeds off Jarvis Landry's success. If you have Ryan Tannehill put the game in Devontae Parker's hands to win it for them, I like the Bengals' chances. But if they let Jarvis Landry get loose, they're in for a day. Uh, The defense aside, I understand that he has a very big angry fan club. Um, but I am a, I do love me some Indomitian and Sue, man. I can't lie to you. He's so dominant and he's such a good football player. Um, he, yes, I will give you all the stomps and everything there. I won't fight that case by any means, but he is a guy you got to plan for. Uh, do I feel co- uh, comfortable with Russell Bodine standing over Indomitian and Sue? Not at all. No, not being a stretch of the matter. I think Kevin Seitler's going to have to do some, some, uh, some crash blocking there. Uh, the Bengals are probably going to have to run at Sue a lot of plays, especially with guys like Cameron Wake there. Uh, like, you know, Matthew mentioned Kiko Alonso. Um, if they can take Indomitian and Sue out of this game, and I think that that is, a, I think they really will be able to, they better hope they can. Um, I think they're fine. Those are the two guys I think that if you can game plan on those two, because I, I, I like Ryan Tannehill's athleticism, I like his arm. I, I just don't think if the game's on the line, I could ever trust him to win a game for me. No, I mean the one the one thing defense wise they've got to watch out is definitely Kiko Alonso. He's due for something, uh, and, and he is a big time player for this Miami defense. Uh, and Dominican Sue is is a is a key pass rusher and, and a guy who can disrupt the backfield, but he's still even not the Dominican Sue we knew from Detroit, right. and we and we've seen that. So 
Uh, I mean, yes, you have to plan for Nadama Nid- Kinsu, but they can control him. Kiko Alonso, if he finds ways to disrupt the run game, then it really opens up Nadama Kinsu for going uh, going against the, the passing game. So you really have to control Kiko Alonso, in my opinion, first, and then follow with suit with Nadama Kinsu. Uh, in terms of the offense. The big thing they've got to watch out for and something they've they struggled with in the past is the play of the tight ends, and that would be Jordan Cameron. He's out. Is he out? Yep. Well, that, that out. No, I, I mean, uh, the, the passing game has really been a, a key factor for the Dolphins, and so even then, you've got to then watch out for Ryan Tannehill trying to to make use of, of every other player on that field. And he, you know, losing Jordan Cameron is a huge loss to them again, especially against a team like the Bengals, who sometimes have some holes in the center. But be sure that Ryan Tannehill is going to adjust for that. Um, he is a good enough quarterback, no matter how many times his wife complains about the practice squad picking him off, uh, to uh, to really make that adjustment. And, and yeah, you're right. He has Jarvis Landry, which is a huge piece for them. He also has Devonte Parker. It was a huge piece for that receiving core as well. So, you know, it, it's definitely going to come back on getting the pass rush and, and giving the pass rush time. So this comes back on the secondary and those safeties, giving the pass rush time to get to the quarterback for sure. I think one yeah. thing we really got to look for in this game too is, uh, like I mentioned, Arian Foster not playing. Uh, Kenyon Drake's probably going to get some catches out of the backfield. Uh, I think that that's kind of their goal with him, to kind of use him kind of like a bigger version of Giovanni Bernard. Uh, so I think he's going to be a player to watch in this game also. Yeah, and I and I, I agree with both of you. I mean, their offense uh, really starts with Jarvis Landry uh, since Lamar Miller left for Houston. Uh, so that's someone you got to control. He's the number one receiver, uh, so you got to give him respect. And he's he's going to get his targets and he's going to get his catches. Even when the Bengals shut down Antonio Brown a few weeks ago, he still had a few key catches to keep keep the uh, uh, chains moving. I think uh, for the Bengals to key in. Uh, on defense, I would say Byron Maxwell. Yeah. Uh, corner mm-hmm. for the Dolphins. Uh, he's not the same corner he was in Seattle when he had the Legion of Boom out. And I think uh, Thursday night could be in a, a huge game for A.J. Green if he sees some single coverage. And, you know, uh, I, I I would love to see him, even if it doesn't work, uh, stretch the field with Green once. That Denver game, I don't think Dalton, before the last drive, that didn't even mean anything, threw a pass over 20 yards in the air. Maybe the one to Uzoma was. But, I mean, even even taking one deep shot, just to just to hey, say, hey, we're there. I mean, we're going to take it if it's there. That's what I was really disappointed about. I, I hope they uh, I hope they can stretch the field a little bit against Miami and, and someone emerge as a, as a deep threat like Marvin Jones did in his tenure here, uh, whether that be Tyler Boyd or – Brandon LaFell, who had the 49-yard catch against the Jets in Week One, um, and then uh, defensively, I I look I look to key in on Laramie Tunsil, uh, rookie left guard for the Dolphins. Uh, you know him from the the draft day meltdown, <laughs> with the, an unfortunate picture being tweeted out, or, or maybe it was a video. Was it a video? It was. Um, it was. Let's get Ronnie was, Stanley a big payday. Is what it was. Okay. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But, um, yeah, I, I could see Geno Atkins lining up over a rookie. And, you know, as, as tough as it'll be for Bodine against uh, Ndamukong and Sue. And, you know, Bodine's seen Sue before in 2013 when the Bengals went to Detroit. Uh, uh, I think Sue was held to four tackles that day in one quarterback hurry. So Bodine held his weight. But, yeah, you'll see a lot of uh, double teams there, some chippiness with Kevin Zeitler and uh, Clint Bowling as, as, as long as uh, – Whitworth, uh, Eric Winston, Jake Fisher, oh boy, he can hold their own on the ends. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I really think uh, the defensive line should have a good time getting after Tannehill. And also what the Bengals have to watch for is Tannehill running backfield too. Uh, you mentioned his athleticism and, you know, I, I've seen, we saw Dalton do it a few times against Denver uh, coming out of the pocket and running with the ball and uh, picking up big games on second and third and long. Okay, guys. Tannehill is uh, rusher. <laughs> on that uh, team. I said Tannehill is the leading rusher on that team. Yeah, 54 yards, if you can believe it. Ryan Tannehill is the leading rusher for the Dolphins thus far. Uh, okay, guys, so last week, uh, you know, before the Denver game, Matt and I talked, and we said the one person that really has to step up is Jeremy Hill, and, you know, he answered the call. 
like you mentioned, 97 yards, two, two scores on 17 carries. Uh, a, a good game for him. Probably could have went over 100 yards if the score was a bit closer. Uh, so now looking forward to this week, uh, who do you guys seeing that needs to have a big week, needs to really step up and improve? Start George, with you, Tim. Georgia Loca. Um, you know, there's a reason you chose one, uh, between Loca and Nelson. Uh, it's time for him to show why they chose him. Uh, I love George. I think he's one of the best safeties in the game. I think he's one of the most underrated safeties in the game. And this is his chance to show that. Um, he's got two dropped interceptions already this year. I think, one, if he can get his hands on the ball, he's got to do it. Two, he's got to be a little more disciplined. He had a defensive holding that really, on a third long play that was disrupted by Carlos Dams, we getting a, car, a quarterback rush in Denver that kept the Bengals in the field. Uh, and he was 20 yards away from the ball. Um, this is Georgia Locust time to really step up and show why he's the guy uh, that they decided to keep and why he is one of these talented players. So I think it's time for Loka to really step up and make a name for himself. Big, big player has got to step up this week, and that's A.J. Green. He talked the talk, now he's got to walk the walk. He talked about it being, the, the loss being on his shoulders and how he needs to make those catches. Now he's got to do it. Talking's great. But if you're the star, if you're the star wide receiver for this team, you have to prove why you're the star receiver for this team. And he's really got to be there for Andy Dalton, especially if, since they probably will be missing Eifert for another week. And you know, it, it it all depends on you know what they decide to do in terms of game planning. You know, Jeremy Hill definitely has to continue the momentum, but he's also got to know, or he also has to have the balance on the other side, so he doesn't have. Eight guys stacking in the box against him, and, and they really do have to open up this passing game, and it starts with A.J. Green. Yeah, uh, I agree with both what you're saying. Uh, I look at and Sean Williams, honestly. Uh, each have dropped interceptions. Uh, seems like Josh shaw has been having a great year. 0.0 quarterback rating against still. Yeah, I saw that. And uh, A.J. Green, uh, you know, a tough matchup against Denver, I grant you that, but had the big drop, and you know, if he's going to be that number one elite receiver. Uh, but I, I think he has a, a, gr a very favorable matchup. You know, Terrell Pryor just went for 144 against this Miami defense last week. And, you know, if Pryor could do it, uh, I would think A.J. Green <laughs> could do as well. Um, for my player that really needs to step up, uh, first off on offense real quick, I think Brandon LaFell. Uh, you know, first two games were pretty good. But, you know, just, just giving A.J. Green some support and – it makes it even more if, if Eifert can't go. Uh, but, you know, I know it's still early with LaFell, and he had a limited preseason. He only caught one pass, and that came from A.J. McCarron in the Jacksonville game. Uh, on defense, I'm going to say Michael Johnson. Uh, kind of been a disappearing act thus far. Uh, you know, he and Dunlap, I think they're both six foot six, uh, Very good uh, lengthy arms, too, to bat down passes. And, you know, it's it's really been Marcus Hunt and Will Clark stealing the show, which is great. But, you know, we brought Michael Johnson back last season uh, for what he did uh, as a Bengal. You know, he had ten and a half sacks when the Bengals won the division in 2013. Uh, I, I would love to see the off the defensive line, rather, just generate more pass rush in general. And, and uh, I, I think they'll do that here against Miami. So, uh, guys, before we do our uh, lightning round, uh, we're going to start with the Bengals and Dolphins prediction first before we get into the rest of the NFL. Uh, so, Matt, I'll start with you. Uh, give me your final score of the Bengals-Dolphins game and why. Final score of the Bengals-Dolphins game, I think, is going to be a 32-17 win for the Bengals. I think this Dolphins team is just having a, a really down year. I think they're coming off of a, a very tough game, and, and it was even at home against the Cleveland Browns. And it's just the right time for the Bengals to pounce, get back on track. They're motivated to, to get back on track, make it 2-2, two and two, and not get too far behind uh, this AFC North division. A.J. Green, 100-yard passing uh, receiving game and a touchdown. The Bengals will win this game. I am pretty close to Matt. I have it 30-20. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with you guys. Uh, I, I was going to say... Uh, I said 30 to 20 earlier when I was talking to the friend. <laughs> so uh, I'll change it up and say 30 to 21. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're playing prices right rules here. Right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think this is a must win for the Bengals and they're going to come out prepared. I think Miami, you know, if, if you guys have looked at their injury report, it kind of looks like the Bengals in 2014 when AJ Green was out, Perfect was out, uh, Tyler Eifert was out, Marvin Jones was out. Uh, Giovanni Bernard ended up getting hurt. 
and, and it's early for Miami, and, and it's just been one of those unfortunate things, and it's kind of with the Ravens last year, had 20-something guys on the IR. Uh, Miami is really banged up right now, and they come into Cincinnati uh, limping. I, I think the Bengals uh, keep Andy Dalton upright for most of the game, and uh, he comes back with his third 300-yard passing day of the season. Uh, hopefully he gets some more touchdowns up. I hope Dalton can put up one or two touchdown passes. He only got two through three games, and uh, you know that was everybody's – uh, complain about him in 2014 he only threw 19 touchdowns but yeah I think a big a big win for the Bengals and you know we get to enjoy uh the rest of the NFL slate on Sunday knowing the Bengals already played and won and uh we're on to Dallas and, and Tim if if AJ Green has 100 yards passing <laughs> I promise I'll wear Cincinnati Reds hat next next podcast well uh, it's okay because okay, come next week the Reds and Pirates will be sitting in the same place won't they Yep. Yes, it will be. Yeah, they will. Yes, it will be. <laughs> all right, all right, guys. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here on Men and Stripes before we come back for our lightning round, where we'll pick the rest of the. Men and Stripes is brought to you by Audible.com. Has over a hundred and eighty thousand Audible books available. Everything from sports biographies to mysteries to hobbies. Everything. Get your 30-day trial at audibletrial.com slash meninstripes. Again, 30-day free trial at audible.com or audibletrial.com slash meninstripes. Get it today. And welcome back to Men and Stripes, and we are going to go through our lightning round for the NFL slate for week four. We already gave you our predictions for the Bengals-Dolphins game at Paul Brown Stadium Thursday night. And now we start with the first game on Sunday, going coming a little early in the day for us here in Ohio. Uh, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, Colts at Jaguars across the pond in London. We'll start with Tim. Who do you got? Andrew Luck show is coming back. We saw it against San Diego with the deep bomb to T.Y. Hilton to win the game. Jacksonville makes too many mistakes. It's not going to be enough. I like the Colts. I'm right there with you. I think Colts are desperate to get back on track. Uh, the the Jaguars have just been making too many mistakes over the past few weeks, and uh, Colts Colts take it 20 to 17. Yeah, uh, I'm right there with you guys. Uh, Jacksonville cannot get anything going uh, with the running game with T.J. Yeldon and uh, Chris Ivory, who they just acquired from the Jets. I think Andrew Luck, uh, if you take out a Denver game where he was just pulmerized by that defense like every other quarterback, uh, he's been great this year. 331 yards against the Chargers. I think he leads the Colts to a second straight win uh, over in London. So now the second game, uh, we're going to go Titans at Texans. We'll start with Tim. Without J.J. Watt, as much as I love guys like Will Fork, Clowney, and Whitney Merciless, this defense does not have an identity. Uh, DeMarco Murray has been a sign of relief reviving his career in Tennessee. Um, as much as Tennessee has really struggled to get the passing game going uh, for Marcus Murray to go with guys like Tajay Sharp, um, I think Delaney Walker will be back this week, which is huge for Mariota and his improvement. I like the Titans. I like the Titans. I think they are a better team than what we saw uh, last year. I think that they're moving in the right direction. DeMarco Murray is a huge piece of that. I agree. J.J. Watt is the heart and soul of that defense. I think it's going to be a little bit more of an offensive shootout than what we've seen, especially from the Texans. Uh, and I like Tennessee to win it. I like them 24-21. Ooh. I'm going to go with a different pick. I'm going to take Houston in this one, even though I regretted taking them against the Patriots last uh, Thursday. <laughs> uh, I think Houston plays a lot better at home. Uh, we saw them hold the Chiefs to nine points uh, in week two. Uh, Brock Osweiler still got, got a lot of good weapons around him. Uh, Braxton Miller, Will Fuller, DeAndre Hopkins, uh, Lamar Miller. Tennessee's defense has been stellar this year under Dick LeBeau. They've only given up 42 points on defense, but Marcus Mariota, still a young quarterback. Uh makes a lot of mistakes, and those those mistakes have cost Tennessee some points, and I, I think uh, Houston comes away with this one by like a 20-17 to 17 score. And next, guys, uh, we go to the AFC North where the Browns are in our nation's capital, 0-3, taking on the 1-2 Redskins. Tim. <laughs> Man, ooh, 
Then I don't really think I'd be so excited for that game. Uh, for everything Terrell Pryor did against the Miami Dolphins, he's not going to be able to do against Josh Norman. Uh, I like Washington to go to two and two in this game. Uh, Kirk Cousins is definitely uh, Kirk Cousins fantasy owners. You're going to like that this week. Uh, I'm a, I'm on the opposite side. I in all honesty, all you have to do with uh, with Terrell Pryor's move to the other side of the field because Jay Gruden doesn't know how to move his cornerbacks around. Uh, I actually like. Cleveland in this game to pick up their first win. I hate saying it because, of course, it's Cleveland. But uh, I honestly think that uh, Cleveland's going to pull this one out. I'm going to go 30-21. It's a shame Robert Griffin's not in this game, man. It would have been really cool to see him oh, play back in Washington. Yeah, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna go with Washington in this one. Uh, Cleveland, you know, their running back tandem is a, is a conundrum, uh, whether it's Isaiah Crowell, Duke Johnson Jr., uh, you take away Crowell's long run against the Ravens, and they're not doing much. I think Kirk Cousins, even when they lose, uh, throwing up a lot of yards, and yeah, fantasy owners would uh, dying for this matchup. I think uh, Matt Jones out of the backfield, uh, catching and running, is going to have a big day for Washington. I think they win this one uh, pretty handily against a rookie quarterback, uh, 27-17. Now we're uh, going to go to a kind of a tough matchup. Uh, really, I, I saw this one going uh, either way. Uh, interconference matchup, Seattle at the Jets, uh, 1 o'clock start in the Meadowlands. Uh, Tim, we'll start with you. Uh, looks like right now the plan is for Russell Wilson to play. And if he has Jimmy Graham do what he did last week where we see Jimmy Graham not be Kevin Love, as I've joked before, I think that they're in good shape. Um, I, I really do like this Jets defense. I know that they've been a little off uh, these past couple weeks. I do not like Ryan Fitzpatrick after his sixth pick performance last week against Kansas City by any stretch. So uh, I think the Legion of Boom is just going to be too good. I will take the Seahawks in New York in the Meadowlands for this one. It, it's, it is kind of one of those that could be a toss-up just because of the fact of how both teams struggled early on in the season uh, outside of that Bengals-Jets game where the Jets looked pretty good. Uh, I am going to go Seattle just because I do think Seattle is the better team overall. Uh, I do see, you know, being a little bit of a struggle for the for the Jets to really stop a multiple tandem. And, and Russell Wilson a, is a great quarterback uh, outside of what he did, of course, against the Rams. Uh, <laughs> but uh, even then, I mean, Seattle finds ways to win at, time, or at times when they need to. And uh, they do need to. So uh, I think Seattle's going to pull this one out. Uh, I'm going to go with the Jets at home. Uh, I think, you know, out before last week, you know, the Seahawks torched the 49ers, uh, you know, for 37 points, which, you know, it was expected. Hey. Uh, <laughs> and, and uh you know, before that 49ers win, they played two games where they scored one touchdown. And that was against uh, the Dolphins. They scored a touchdown to win the game, and then they played the Rams and only put up three points. So I think uh, the Jets are a much better defense, obviously, than the 49ers, and they're playing at home. Uh, I think Ryan Fitzpatrick bounces back from just an awful game, which you know we've seen him. We've seen this guy throw six touchdowns in one game before when he was a member of the Texans. So now we saw him have a six-pick performance, but you know he still has great weapons, and that Legion of Boom as we've seen time and time again, is never the same when they're not playing in front of the 12th man. So I think the Jets uh, win this one in a low-scoring game relatively. Uh, I said 19-16. to 16. You know, my wife was questioning when the last time that her Tennessee Titans actually beat Houston, so I, I had to prove to her that it was in this century. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Texas has only been around since 2 <laughs> Oh, uh, 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 and now next, guys, AFC East matchup. Uh, I'm done picking against New England because they always make me look bad. <laughs> but uh, they host Buffalo this Sunday at Foxborough, the last game before Tom Brady gets back from his suspension. And who do you guys got? We'll start with Tim. I am not buying Buffalo. I get they played a great game where they made Carson Palmer look like Ryan Fitzpatrick, but that's not how it's going to go for good. Um Gronk's going to be back for this one. As long as Garrett Blunt keeps running the way he did against Houston, there's no one slowing them down. I think the Patriots be 4-0 and they welcome Brady back. Yeah, um, the day that uh, the 
let's put it this way, the day Buffalo beats New England, I'm pretty sure is the day that Buffalo fans pretty much burn everything in the, the streets from winning that game. Um, so, for me, Buffalo is is not that great of a team. I know, Tim, we talked about it very early on when we talked about the matchup between the Bengals and the Bills. And uh, I know you were high on Tyrod Taylor being the quarterback, and I'm not. I, I just don't think that he is the answer in, in Buffalo. I see New England winning this game, winning this game very handedly, and uh, Brady coming back to an undefeated team. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm with you with the New England pick. I think Tyrod Taylor is the answer for Buffalo, um, you know, but he has to do it on a consistent basis. Uh, you know, a lot of the times uh, he's throwing for 300 yards, doing great things, and then the next day uh, he just comes out flat like you saw in the Baltimore uh, season opener. I think he threw for 119 yards uh, and was just very just very stagnant offense by Buffalo in that game. Uh, with the Patriots, they just seem to win uh, – you know, Tyrod Taylor this year is working with a very limited Sammy Watkins uh, with that toe injury, making uh, me and all his other fantasy owners uh, <laughs> very doubtful of him. Uh, but I, I, I see LeGarrette Blunt having a big day. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo or Jacoby Brissett, not sure who's playing quarterback. I don't really care at this point because I'm not going to pick against the Patriots. Uh, I think they win this one 21-10, uh, to 10, somewhere around there. Uh, Belichick is too good of a coach, and the Patriots go four and zero. They go five and zero next week when they play Cleveland in Cleveland, and then uh, they host the Bengals at five and zero in Week Six. Yeah, so we got the Patriots winning that one. And now uh, this one also an intriguing matchup: uh, Carolina one and two going up against Atlanta two and one uh, at the Georgia Dome. Now, who do you guys have? Atlanta's defense will never be able to stop anybody. I know that Drew Brees threw some bad passes last night, but come on. We're putting if we have this game and it's do you trust the Atlanta Falcons defense with the game in the line to stop Cam Newton? The answer one hundred percent is no. Cam Newton wins this one. The Panthers are two and two. You know, normally I would agree with that, especially when it comes to the Atlanta Falcons. But this is also a division game, and that's something we've seen Atlanta do against division teams, and that is find ways where you don't think ways are even possible. And, I, you know, I think Cam has something to prove. But we did, did you, you said it was in the Georgia Dome, right? It is. I, I don't know. I, I, th- I think Matt Ryan – I think Matt Ryan has something to prove too. And, and especially when he struggled early on in that Saints game, I think there is a shot that, that, or that, uh, that Arizona – yeah, that Atlanta wins this game. Uh, different different type of bird there, and uh, and, and I'm going to say that that they pull it out. It's going to be close. I think it's going to be something where you're looking at a, a 31 to to 28 type game. Yeah, I I'm going to go with Carolina. Um, you know, even though Tim, you mentioned is is Atlanta's defense going to come up make a stop, and and you know they did just that last year, handed the Panthers their only regular season loss uh, in the Georgia Dome. But I think just this year, uh, Newton, he's gotten a bad rap. He's lost two games, but it's it's come against uh, the AFC's best defense and the NFC's best defense. And, it, it, you know, I, I get it. They're one and two, so you're not going to hype him up. But, you know, when he starts playing uh, these NFC South defenses that none of them are very good, including <laughs> the Panthers' secondary, uh, I, I think he's going to put up a high amount of points. And I think the Panthers uh, win this game like around 31 to 24, uh, you know, as, as good as Matt Ryan has played, I think Carolina will take away Devontae Freeman with a, a solid linebacking group and, uh, and force Matt Ryan into some turnovers. Next, uh, another member of the AFC North, uh, 3-0 and Baltimore Ravens. Uh, three unimpressive wins, but, you know, wins nonetheless. Uh, they host the Oakland Raiders this Sunday at 1 p.m. in Baltimore. Who do you have? If this were in the black hole, I would pick the Raiders. Um, I do love Derek Carr and Amari Cooper, even though Amari Cooper has struggled a little bit with the dropsies this year. Latavius Murray's had a pretty good year for Oakland, too. Um, but there is something about Joe Flacco playing at M&T Bank Stadium where he's just good, and he makes things happen. Um, I like Baltimore in this one. 
very close, uh, but I could definitely see this game going either way. I, and this may be more of the hope pick because I would hate to see the Ravens go 4-0. Uh, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to go with Oakland. I would love to see Derek Carr prove that he can win on the opposite side of the uh, states. I think that he is a good quarterback. I like to see Amari Cooper step it up and, and, and really have a comeback game type of game where he is, you know, in, in all honesty, what – Oakland had been hoping that he was going to be. Uh, and, and, of course, I mean, we we know that uh, there are some question marks uh, on, on this Raiders team still, especially on the defensive side of the ball. But in, in all honesty, I think Oakland overall is the better team on paper. I would love to see them be a better team on the field. Uh, I, I'm going to go with Oakland. uh in this one, and I, I, I'm kind of with you, Matt. It's like a hope pick. It's like, you know, I really don't want to see Baltimore go 4-0. But, uh, you know, I think the Raiders bounce back. They were shut out in the second half against Tennessee last week. Um, Baltimore, you know, this is still a secondary that got lit up by Josh McCown and Corey Coleman two weeks ago. And, you know, if it wasn't for Blake Bortles making some absolutely boneheaded throws last yeah. week, I think Jacksonville beats the Ravens. And I think Derek Carr, uh, overall, you don't see him make too many terrible decisions with the football. I mean, he's wise enough to throw it away. And Oakland has the ability to drop a pair of touchdowns on you in the drop of a hat. So I'm going to go with Oakland in a, in a close game. I'm going to say around 27-23. Now we, uh, from the AFC North to the NFC North, uh, Detroit at Chicago. Uh, Detroit coming off a loss to Green Bay. Chicago is 0-3 without their starting quarterback. Uh, I, I have a feeling this pick is going to be unanimous, and we'll start with Tim. So, um, you guys have heard me say, and I've said it many times through the offseason, that I don't think Marvin Jones is going to be a huge loss for the Bengals. And although he's having an outstanding year, I still don't think that's the case. I understand he wanted to go be a wide receiver one, and... He is continuing to show that with an outstanding game last week in Lambeau against the Packers defense has done really well so far. Um, for the love of God, can Golden Tate get a touchdown? Please, something. Show that he's out there on the field and that he exists. All jokes aside, you're talking about a Matthew Stafford offense where they're going to throw a lot with guys like Theo Riddick coming out of the backfield, Marvin Jones, Anquan Bolden, Eric Ebron, and I guess if you want to mention he's part of the team Golden Tate against a Bears team that I hope Alshon Jeffrey's healthy because we know Jeremy Langford's out. This is going to be a night for the Detroit Lions, and they're going to continue to ride this win streak. Well, I'll just make it quick. It's Detroit. I mean, it, yeah, it's Detroit. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, same thing, uh, Detroit. Uh, you know, Marvin Jones getting a lot of, of, of padded stats because, you know, Detroit was down 31-3 to against Green Bay, and, you know, the Lions running game isn't nothing to write home about. But, you know, Chicago – Arguably the worst team in football right now. Brian Hoyer is a quarterback. Uh, you lost Matt Forte. Alshon Jeffries hurt. Uh, I see Kevin White probably getting 18 targets this week. <laughs> but I, I, th I think the Lions uh, win it 27-14. to Deshaun Kaiser going to look really good in a Bears jersey next year, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> now uh, the team the Bengals just lost to the defending champions, uh, Denver Broncos. They are going uh, once again heading uh, – East to uh, on the Eastern Time Zone. Going to go to Tampa Bay to play the Buccaneers. Who do you guys have? Um, I love what Mike Evans is doing this year. Uh, Jameis Winston is just going to make too many mistakes, and he doesn't have that safety pad by the name of Doug Martin behind him. We know what this Denver defense is going to do to you, and I think Jameis is going to have a great career, but it's not going to be tonight. It's going to be that night. I think the Denver Broncos continue to have their mad rush, and they'll be four zero come the end of, uh, come the it comes to come zero zeros on the at the end of that game. I will stick by my continual statement that I do not think that Jameis Winston, although in his young career he has been a he has been a half decent quarterback, I don't think that he will be the best quarterback out of that draft. I think he stumbles again, and I, I just don't see t uh, any way Tampa Bay can can pull this game off against the best defense, arguably in the NFL. Yeah, Denver wins this game twenty to seven or twenty seven to seven maybe. Uh, Tampa Bay is giving up an NFL worst, 37 points a game. The Rams just dropped 37 points on them at home. 
Uh, would love to see what Trevor Simeon, after his big day in Cincy, uh, does to Tampa there. But I think the Broncos uh, win that game handily. Uh, next, we have the Rams uh, playing in Arizona against the 1-2 and two Cardinals. Cardinals are going to be pissed. They're a f- completely different team at home. The Rams can still not make it their best player to make things happen because they can't block for them. And that stays the case this week. I think Carson Palmer has a retribution this week. Arizona wins. Uh, Arizona wins because they don't want to lose another game for sure. Um, and they don't want to lose another game in the season for sure. Uh, Carson Palmer, uh, as much as I hate to say it because I would rather – uh, but he, in my opinion, both, te- both abandon each other. Uh, I, I really see him. He's a great quarterback. There's no way that Larry Fitzgerald doesn't put up another great game. And, uh, yeah, they, they went handily over the Rams. Yeah, I, I think Palmer's regressing uh, by the week. I mean, since that NFC Championship game against Carolina, I mean, he, he'll he give you – I mean, even with the Bengals game last year, he gave the Bengals a few and I, it, some erratic throws. I mean, for as many good ones as he has, uh, turns it over just as much, uh, maybe a little less. But I, I see Arizona winning this game. I see it being reminiscent to – Week two against Tampa Bay after they lost to the Patriots. They came back home, beat the Buccaneers by 33 points. Uh, They win that game. Uh, Next, uh, Drew Brees returns to San Diego. The Saints at the Chargers. Um, Normally, I would pick the Chargers in this game. And this is not because of my Notre Dame fandom. And I don't even think he's that great of an NFL linebacker. But Manti Teo has really became the leader of that linebacking court in San Diego. And him being gone really kind of crushes them. Um, Drew Brees is pissed, guys. He's leading the league in passing on an 0-3 team. He's going to continue to light it up. This is going to be a game of retribution where we know Drew Brees is a super nice guy, but he's going to let him have it. I think that's New Orleans Saints finally get win one of the season. Yeah, I'm going Chargers on this one, and that's just because it's the Chargers have proven, I think, me wrong every single week so far. Uh, so uh, it's about time that I at least uh, figure out a way to jump on that bandwagon because – they have proven that maybe they aren't the same team that we saw last season and that they have they have the chance to win every week. And uh, as much as Drew Brees really would like to get that first win, I just don't see the Saints team as the same Saints team that uh, we saw even a few years ago. And uh, he, Drew Brees really has, has outplayed his team, but... He still has to play a team sport, so he's got to rely on guys that haven't really uh, made it happen, especially on that defense. Yeah, I'm going San Diego as well. Uh, I think the Chargers are a few plays away from being three and zero right now, uh, but instead they're one and two. Uh, Drew Brees and the Saints. Brees always just regresses when he plays outside the Superdome. I mean, he, he threw for 368 yards against the Giants in New York. Or New Jersey, wherever they play, uh, and, and he could he he could still only get them uh, in the end zone once, and they lost that game by a field goal. So, so give me the Chargers moving to two and two, the Saints uh, zero and four. If you're now, out there, uh, you're in New York, it's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> now, guys, uh, Dak Prescott's impressed a lot of people, and he'll go for a three and one start when the Cowboys visit the 49ers. Ah, man, he's going to keep rolling, man. I'm telling you what, Zach Prescott is building some some uh, some chemistry with Des Bryant, which is what he was missing in that first game that we saw when they struggled against the Giants. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott is really beca- I mean, really getting better every week. He's really, I mean, he didn't fumble at all this, uh, this past matchup. Matthew's laughing at because he knows that the Dallas Cowboys have a piece of my heart, and uh, I, can't, I can't say he's wrong, but I can't trust Blaine Gabbert to beat anybody in the NFL. And I think that uh, it's gonna we're gonna be talking. How about them Cowboys with a win this week? Oh, I was more laughing at the fact that you had to say a player from Ohio State was doing good. Doesn't uh, bother me. No, Ezekiel Elliott is uh, has been a decent piece of that team if he can hold on to the ball. Dak Prescott has really impressed a lot of people, and, and he's mm-hmm. impressed me to uh, to have the start that he has had. Uh, minus the, the their one hiccup. It, what it was it was against the Giants if I'm not mistaken mm-hmm. and so really he, I think he continues to impress this week I'm going Dallas yeah and you know I, I don't want to overestimate Ezekiel Elliott after you know he torched a, a Bears defense that is just awful but I, I do have the Cowboys winning 
uh, against the 49ers. Uh, this would be a great game to watch if it was 1994. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think Blaine Gabbard, uh, 49ers leading receivers, Jeremy Curley. And, I mean, I, I didn't know that guy was still in the league to be honest. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go with the Cowboys, like 23-13. to 13. Uh, Prescott's not turning the ball over, and that's and that's a winning formula. And don't diss that Emmitt Smith 94 game on Super NES. I mean, come on. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> Shelby's young. He doesn't know what we're talking about. How old are you, Tim? 27. Are you really? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I, I don't I didn't know. <laughs> All right, two uh, prime time games that aren't the Bengals. Uh, we'll start with the dreaded rival. Uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers are hosting the Chiefs after just a lovely loss to the Eagles, thirty-four to three. I mean that was great. But uh, anyway, Chiefs at Heinz Field. Uh, who do you got in that one? That's a tough game, man, because I know the Pittsburgh Steelers are a completely different team at Heinz Field. Where they will go out there and they will do they will do big things. I do think they're gonna have retribution on their mind, obviously, after a very, very, very unflattering performance that they had in Philly, where Carson Wentz showed that he is the man. He is the man. Um, but what worries me about this game is uh, they're talking about Jamal Charles starting. I don't think that the Pittsburgh Steelers front seven should be the game you have your first start against. Uh, maybe you can go another week of Spencer Ware, but if they really are going Jamal Charles, I am not ready to say the Kansas City Chiefs will win this game. I think Antonio Brown still had a really good game against Philly last week, even though a lot of it had some garbage time plays. Pittsburgh will unfortunately be 3-1 and one after this one. I really hope I'm wrong. You didn't even mention the, the key person coming back for the Steelers, and that's Le'Veon Bell. Yeah. Uh, he's back from suspension as well. And, and of course, in, to put it in, in the perspective of Arrowhead Addict, our actually kind of parents who started the whole fan-sided network. Uh, the Chiefs are getting no respect versus the Steelers. Uh, unfortunately, rightfully so. The Steelers get this win, unfortunately, at least in my mind, they go 3-1. and one. But luckily, with how we predicted, the Bengals will still only be one game behind them. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm going to go uh, with Pittsburgh. I, ju- I just don't think Mike Tomlin's going to – uh, let them turn around after that loss in Philly and, and lose to Kansas City. But but I think this has all the making. and I would love to be wrong. I think we all would. Uh, but I think this has all the makings of Kansas City possibly pulling up an yeah. upset. Uh, Travis Kelsey, tight end, matches well against the Steelers secondary. That's awful. Uh, Jeremy Macklin gets a lot of targets. And, and more importantly, you know, Ben Roethlisberger uh, against a fierce Kansas City pass rush and a defense that just picked off Ryan Fitzpatrick. I, I know Ben Roethlisberger's head and shoulders above Ryan Fitzpatrick, but you know you still can literally pressure by him. height. Yeah, and, but you can still pressure him in, into some uh, errant throws. I, I think the, the the pieces are there for the Chiefs to pull off a close win, but for right now, I think I think Pittsburgh wins like twenty to sixteen. And, and don't forget too, the next two weeks are teams that the Steelers have been predicted to beat numerous times, and they found ways to lose against both the Chiefs and the Jets. And, guys, our last game of the week, the Giants at the undefeated Minnesota Vikings. Who do you got? Skull Vikings, skull! I'm in, guys. I am all in, even without Adrian Peterson, even without Teddy Bridgewater. Stephon Diggs, a star in the making, continues to do big things, and an unbelievable Vikings defense makes Sam Bradford's job very easy. Well, number one, it is in Minnesota at, no offense, one of the nicest stadiums. Oh, my God, it's beautiful. And number two, it is still a Mike Zimmer defense. And Mike Zimmer defenses are ridiculous. So I'm going Minnesota Vikings to go 4-0. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll agree with all of you there. Uh, Minnesota leads the NFL with 15 sacks. And, you know, if we know Eli Manning... The same formula that won him two Super Bowl MVPs is the same uh, formula that has him throw four interceptions sometimes. I mean, he he'll just he kind of throws it into tight windows, and and I think Minnesota, led by Terrence Newman in the secondary, he's had a couple picks already so far. How in the world? Are you uh, saying Emmanuel, he's leading this team over Harrison Smith? I think he ha- I think Newman has two picks. Yes, but yes, I agree with that. No, but there's no way. The de- <laughs> he doesn't say. Lead the- <laughs> yeah, he doesn't lead the defense. I, I, I'm saying he, he he might lead them in picks. Fair. 
Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, Harrison Smith, Anthony Barr, uh, great group on the Vikings defense. And on offense, uh, you know, we didn't mention, but, you know, Sam Bradford in two games, uh, 67.8 completion percentage, uh, 467 yards, three touchdowns, no turnovers. Uh, Adrian Peterson wasn't doing much uh, even when he was there for the first two games. So I I, I love Minnesota in this game. And, and yeah, that stadium is uh, breathtaking. Yeah, we go there next year, man. I might have to drive up for that. Yeah, so. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you guys, with all of that, uh, we are done here on Men in Stripes. We uh, thank you guys all for joining us. And I uh, don't know about your guys' schedule for next week, but uh, <laughs> hopefully uh, before the Cowboys game, we'll be uh, talking again on another episode of Men in Stripes and hopefully be celebrating a 2-2 two and two start. Sounds good, man. Good job for your first uh, MC, and you did a great job. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll definitely see you guys next week. Hopefully we're back on schedule, Tim, unless you have any other uh, unexpected surprises. Well, I'm going to the game Thursday. That was the only reason we were going to the game. No, I, you Are both you? were the game yeah. Thursday. Let's grab a beer. Okay. Awesome. It's I, I, legal of age. Right. <laughs> Are you? I, yeah, I'm 21. Oh, okay. okay. But I, I thought you were my age, too. <laughs> no, not anymore. Okay. So, since we're questioning birthdays, we'll, we'll, we'll get out of here. So. <laughs> All right, guys, have a great one. Who day? Who day?